Today we'll be breaking down all of the players in Apple's Mac line so that hopefully you can take a step back and see everything that is currently present or about to be present in the Mac line. And perhaps this could help all of us understand what spaces are kind of vacant that need to be filled by either new Mac products or what other spaces are kind of unnecessary and what needs to be dropped. And I'll be throwing in my opinion here and there. But luckily, I think it's as simple as it's been actually in a long, long time. And most recently, Apple has essentially updated everything Thing, for the most part in the Mac lineup pretty relevantly and within the last year. So I feel like now is a good time to talk about it. Without further ado, let's begin. It all starts out with the two MacBooks. We got the MacBook Pro for the people out there who want that extra power and the MacBook Air for the people who just want a light and simple notebook that happens to run Mac OS, will get many, many years of support and work well within their Apple integrated ecosystem. So starting with the MacBook Air, you don't have that touch bar, but you do have Touch ID. Both MacBooks have Touch ID, by the way. While this does not feature the fastest cores out there or the most extravagant storage options, this is going to be perfect for students out there or people who use their laptops in ways that don't require a lot of GPU and CPU power. So this means a lot of note taking or a lot of email writing, watching content as it still rocks some really good speakers and supports the best port ever USB-C Thunderbolt 3. So that even if yes, you're not a power user out there, you can still dock this thing to a TV display and charge it simultaneously or get a multi-purpose Thunderbolt 3 adapter and get all your old ports back and still be able to charge simultaneously while not creating too much weight in the bag. So you can easily throw this MacBook Air in your backpack. Won't be adding too much weight, but you'll still have a good amount of screen real estate to work with. Then moving on to the MacBook Pros, we have a little bit more customization. All of these models now have touch bars. Also, all have Touch ID as well, and all of them have a base minimum of a quad-core CPU, which even when they're clocked pretty low, can perform pretty well. As John Morrison has showcased in some of his videos in the past, the MacBook Pros are objectively a lot, lot faster than the Air. They do take a little bit of sacrifice in in weight and thickness as the MacBook Pro is a little bit heavier, but still overall very, very thin, very light, and the customizations are much more plentiful because while the MacBook Pro starts out just like the MacBook Air with its two Thunderbolt 3 ports, it's upgradable to four Thunderbolt 3 ports and of course has that very, very well-known and very, very popular 15-inch model, which has louder speakers, of course that bigger, subjectively better display if you like having that bigger screen with you. Granted, you're gonna feel it in the bag or the backpack because it is a four-pound laptop, which is still pretty light, but it's noticeably heavier than the 13-inch MacBooks. And those are going to give you some dedicated GPUs as well for a very, very thin product. But the most recent generations of the 15-inch MacBook Pro can reach some insane clock speeds with their octa-core CPUs, some of which hit the baseline performance of Apple's iMac Pro, which we'll talk about in a second. But the MacBook Pros are trying to cover a wide range of Pro users out there that need something that is compact that they can take with them and on the go, but still have some good processing power as well while simultaneously still offering all of those things the MacBook Air was good for, a reliable, comfortable, premium feeling laptop with good speakers and a nice display, but just going a little bit more above and beyond than the MacBook Air did. And believe it or not, as simple as it seems, that covers it. That is all of Apple's MacBook line. The rest of the Macs we're talking about for this video are desktops. Desktops have very much fallen in sales lately because of the processing power people can now get with MacBooks, even though they have thermal throttling, even though they may not be as fast, or give you as good as performance as a desktop can for the same price, a lot of people end up going with the MacBook Pros because they want something that gives them the flexibility of mobility. So it's cool that the iMac for the same price can be a lot faster than the MacBook, but if people can throw it in their bag and take it with them to college and everything, they're willing to go there. But maybe some of us know we're going to be planted at a desk throughout the day, or classrooms are buying up lots of different models to stay fixated in a particular room. It all starts out with the Mac Mini. Updated just last year, the Mac Mini has recently been updated to be more solid state friendly. So in fact, now you can only use solid states in the new Mac Mini, but supporting a good amount of legacy ports. Unlike the MacBook Air and Pro, which are going all in on Thunderbolt 3, the Mac Mini knows that the main reason you're probably buying this is you don't want that iMac that forces you to get that display and keeps all those ports on the back and you have to kind of set it up and use it in a specific way. Mac Mini is a bit more versatile because it's far more compact. You don't have to worry about using an all-in-one design 
design. And while it's not very user upgradable, and a lot of people have been disappointed with it because of the thermal paste used on the Mac Mini, I still find it quite impressive that you're able to buy a Mac OS equipped machine under $1,000 that not only has an HDMI 2.0 port, which can support a full 4K resolution, but you can plug in that 4K monitor and still have four Thunderbolt 3 ports available. Granted, this is going to be a piece of the rest of your setup because it's not providing you with a display or even a keyboard and mouse, but the Mac Mini is a very, very helpful Mac for a lot of people out there that want something they can shove into a moving stand, but still give them plenty of Thunderbolt 3 ports, plug it into monitors via HDMI, and also still rocking around the traditional USB ports, headphone jack, 10 gigabit ethernet for servers, and Apple has even showcased how these things can kind of become a modular computer by docking them together so that they can all sync up and become one very, very powerful machine for those out there who are into that type of thing. Many out there would agree that the Mac Mini could use a cheaper starting price or that it starts a little bit too high for the CPU in the storage they start you out with, but I'm an owner of one. I use it for a lot of live streaming and it's done a great job. And the upgradability that Apple allows for on its website, I think is pretty good. But yeah, if you were hoping for a Mac tower that you could upgrade yourself, you're gonna have to wait till the end of the video because the next step in the Mac lineup is the all-in-ones. Starting out with the 21 and a half inch iMac, these I think are probably the most dated Macs in the entire lineup. The Mac mini kind of just recently got refreshed last year, which may not seem like that recent, but if you consider how often the Mac Mini gets refreshed, that's pretty new. The MacBook Pro got refreshed a couple months ago, the MacBook Air just a month ago, and while there were some new Intel CPU options for the iMac that were launched back in March, the lower end iMacs, the 21 and a half inch version, still ship by default with regular hard disk drives, which I think is completely unacceptable in 2019. In fact, it's funny to me that even the non-retina display one, just the standard 1080p display, which maybe some people out there don't care about 4K. I'm find that Apple wants to have a 1080p cheaper iMac out there for people who want it. It's a $90 upgrade just to switch it with a one terabyte fusion drive. Apple, you should just get rid of the hard disk drive. And while solid state drives have lowered in price a lot recently, that hasn't really been reflected with the upgradable options with the iMac line. Yes, before you check out the iMac on the website, you can upgrade it to an SSD, a pretty good size one too, both for the 21 and a half inch and the 27 inch iMac, which performance wise is catching up to the speed that the iMac Pro has achieved, but it really hasn't been updated since 2017 when it first originally came out, but they're giving it octa-core support, they're giving more RAM options, and letting people not have to spend, you know, the $5,000 for the Intel Xeon chips, but still get really, really good performance out of these all-in-one desktops. Yes, the SSD upgrades are not great, and of course, if you're buying an all-in-one, you should know this thing is not going to be user upgradable. This is not something you're going to be able to swap out parts for in the future, but if you can compare the prices of any other monitor out there that has the crisp and color accurate 5K monitors that they ship inside the 27 inch iMac and even the 4K monitors they ship in the 21 and a half inch iMac, you'll realize that if you wanted to find another computer out there that had a comparable monitor to that one and also could build the entire computer inside it. So you just have one power cable. It's the easiest thing in the world to set up. You literally just take it out of the box and plug it in. No building PC required, no installing operating systems. For sure, with the iMac, what you're losing in those SSD prices, you are gaining in ease of use, warranty support. Those integrated speakers on the iMacs, which are actually really underrated and I think sound pretty good. And those incredibly good displays, which Apple is basically just throwing in there. Because if you find any other monitor that's close to a 5K iMac monitor, you'll notice that the price comes pretty close. And that's just for a screen. That's not with the whole computer included. There's definitely a demographic out there for the 5K and 4K iMacs. I definitely think the hard drives need to be updated though. The SSDs are way too expensive and they need to stop shipping regular hard disk drives. Those are too outdated. And I know a lot of people out there probably hate the fusion drives even, but I oftentimes think the fusion drive is a bit faster than most people make it out to be. For anyone who's spending that little money on a desktop computer, they probably aren't going to notice the speeds being that different. For the higher end pros though, that really need that extra performance and that extra write speed, that's where the iMac Pro enters the picture. This is also arguably one of the most dated products in the lineup because as of right now, at the time of recording this video, it has been released back in 2017 and they really haven't done much with it since then. We're nearing the end of 2019 and they have added a RAM option since its release. They've added an extra GPU option, but everything else has kind of stayed the same. And you guys saw my review of it lately. This thing is a tank. If you were to try to take all of the parts that the iMac Pro is equipped with and build a PC with it, you would realize that it's not really that big of an Apple 
triple tax. This thing is the complete picture. Huge amounts of storage, PCIe based storage, so it's extra fast, an incredible 5K display. The speakers are actually improved on the iMac Pro as well, better than that of the 5K iMac, plus the added bonus of a very good webcam at 1080 at 60, and of course that cool looking space gray design out there for people who want something a bit more exclusive and want it to be known that, hey, I paid top dollar for this thing, and the price for the iMac Pro can easily reach up to $10,000, and for a non-upgradable machine, it's able to get you a lot of performance, and like I said in my review, it ages very, very well. It's very difficult to see any kind of wear down or slowness build over time. I've been using it for 20 months now, and it's still just as fast as the day I bought it. No battery degradation to worry about with an all-in-one, and this is for people out there that the regular 5K iMacs just don't cut it, and they need a desktop, but they want it to be clean and simple and still be an all-in-one, just have the entire package in one purchase, one power cable has to be plugged in. But of course, you guys know how this ends. Sometimes there's extreme pros out there. There's people that the iMac Pro, it's cool and all, but they want to upgrade and customize the machine themselves. They want to swap out the parts. They want to give it the GPU and storage that they specifically want. And that's where Apple has entered the Mac Pro now. Higher than that of the iMac Pro, this thing starts at $6,000. And the base model, I think, is pretty mediocre in regards to specs. Still, a $6,000 machine with 256 gigs of storage, but you're not paying for those basic parts that it ships with by default. You're paying for the slots. If anyone's buying a Mac Pro, they're not buying it for just the parts that come included with it. They're buying it because they want expansion. They want slots that are going to last them a long, long time so that down the road they can upgrade it. The GPUs, they can upgrade the storage, give it more RAM down the road. That's what you're really paying for when you buy a Mac Pro. Meaning that if you're just in the market for a computer and your budget is six to $7,000, while you may be technically able to afford the Mac Pro, it's probably not for you because that's meant for people who want to upgrade it down the road, want to make sure they have all those options for slots, and really the only purpose of that starting price $6,000 Mac Pro is for people who want to buy up a bunch of these things. They're gonna end up putting all their own hardware inside it anyway. They're just paying for that extra slots in that Mac OS support. Plus that ease of access that you can just take the lid off the Mac Pro and have 360 degree access to all the slots and components. And Apple tells us that it runs very, very quietly and is very good at cooling down all of the insides. And I think if there's anyone out there that is looking to buy a pro class editing machine, iMac Pro just can't do it for them. And your budget is starting at $10,000 and probably going to go up from there, then yes, the Mac Pro serves that very, very, very tiny audience. It's not a huge number of people, but it's a rich number of people. So that's why I guess Apple is catering towards it. And like I said in the beginning of this video, desktops are dying. People aren't buying them like they used to because mobile products are getting better and better and better. So in my opinion, it makes sense that Apple tries to cover the desktop market best it can. Though in conclusion, I still think there's a few areas where Apple could enter a new computer or a new machine that a lot of people could likely take advantage of. Snazzy Labs talked about it on his channel as well. Making a smaller, more affordable Mac Pro that still has the upgradability with those slots that you can work with for your own hardware, but not quite at the insane starting price of the $6,000 Mac Pro. If they could make something smaller than that, but still have the upgradability factor, but start at somewhere between two to $3,000, I think there'd be a huge market of people willing to buy a Mac enabled computer that allows them to upgrade the parts themselves without having to be an ultra pro machine. Something that's a bit more achievable to the masses. And I think that's probably the biggest gap in the Mac lineup that we talked about today. But of course there may be others. I think if I had to get rid of anything in the Mac lineup, it would be the lower end 4K IMAX. Maybe it's just because I'm used to a 27 inch display on my all-in-one desktops, but I just think there's not much more logic in a 21 and a half inch all-in-one desktop anymore. Like I grew up with one in middle school, but that was so tiny. And nowadays I feel like if you're buying a desktop, you might as well just opt for the 5K iMac. And if you're looking for something smaller than the 27 inch design, then just go with a MacBook and then buy like an external monitor so that you can at least take it with you. Because if you're wanting to buy an all-in-one, but you don't want it to be bigger than 21 and a half inches and you're okay with buying a computer that small, I would say might as well just get a mobile machine at that point. Opt for a MacBook Pro with that kind of money and then have a nice docking station at home. That's just me though. I could be wrong. I'd love to hear where you guys think Apple needs to start ditching designs or where Apple needs to insert new designs. Letting me know by hitting me up over on Twitter or joining our Discord. This is your Apple Sheep here. I'll see you guys in the next one.